James Thompson. The City of Dreadful Night. Lo, thus is prostate, in the dust I write, my heart's deep languor and my soul's sad tears. Yet why evoke the specters of black night to blot the sunshine of exultant years? Why disinter dead faith from moldering hidden? Why break the seals of mute despair unbidden and wail life's discords into careless ears? Because a cold rage seizes one at whiles to show the bitter old and wrinkled truth, stripped naked of all vesture that beguiles, false dreams, false hopes, false masks, and modes of youth. Because it gives some sense of power and passion in helpless innocence to try to fashion our woe in living words, however uncouth. Surely I write not for the hopeful young, or those who deem their happiness of worth, or such as pasture and grow fat among the shows of life, and feel nor doubt nor dearth, or pious spirits with the God above them, to sanctify and glorify and love them, or sages who foresee a heaven on earth. For none of these I write, and none of these could read the writing if they deigned to try. So may they flourish in their due degrees, on our sweet earth and in their unplaced sky. If any cares for the weak words here written, it must be someone desolate, fate-smitten, whose faith and hope are dead, and who would die. Yet here and there some weary wanderer in that same city of tremendous night will understand the speech and feel a stir of fellowship in all disastrous fight. I suffer mute and lonely, yet another uplifts his voice to let me know a brother travels the same wild paths, though out of sight. O oh, sad fraternity, do I unfold your dolorous mystery shrouded from of yore? Nay, be assured, no secret can be told to any who divined it not before. None uninitiate by many a presage will comprehend the language of the message, although proclaimed aloud forevermore. 1. The city is of night, perchance of death, but certainly of night, for never there can come the lucid morning's fragrant breath after the dewy dawning's cold gray air. The moon and stars may shine with scorn or pity, the sun has never visited that city, for it dissolveth in the daylight fair. Dissolveth like a dream of night away, though present in distempered gloom of thought, a deadly weariness of heart all day. But when a dream night after night is brought throughout a week, and such weeks few or many recur each year for several years, can any discern that dream from real life and not? For life is but a dream whose shapes return, some frequently, some seldom, some by night, and some by day, some night and day, we learn, the while all change and many vanish quite. In their recurrence with recurrent changes, a certain seeming order, where this ranges, we count things real, such as memories might. A river girds the city west and south, the main north channel of a broad lagoon, regurging with the salt tides from the mouth. Waste marshes shine and glisser to the moon, for leagues, then moorland black, then stony ridges, great piers and causeways, many noble bridges, connect the town and islet suburb strewn. Upon an easy slope it lies at large, and scarcely overlaps the long curved crest which swells out two leagues from the river marge. A trackless wilderness rolls north and west, savannas, savage woods, enormous mountains, bleak uplands, black ravines with torrent fountains, and eastward rolls the shipless sea's unrest. The city is not ruinous, although great ruins of an unremembered past, with others of a few short years ago, more sad, are found within its precincts vast. The street lamps always burn, but scarce a casement, in house or palace front, from roof to basement, doth glow or gleam athwart the murk air cast. The street lamps burn amid the baleful glooms, amidst the soundless solitudes immense, of ranged mansions dark and still as tombs. The silence which benumbs or strains the sense, fulfills with awe the soul's despair and weeping. Myriads of habitats are ever sleeping, or dead or fled from nameless pestilence. Yet, as in some necropolis you find, perchance one mourner to a thousand dead, so there, worn faces that look deaf and blind like tragic masks of stone, with weary tread, each wrapped in his own doom, they wander, wander, or sit foredone and desolately ponder through sleepless hours with heavy drooping head. Mature men chiefly, few in age or youth, a woman rarely, now and then a child, a child, if here the heart turns sick with ruth to see a little one from birth defiled, or lame or blind, as preordained to languish through youthless life, 
Think how it bleeds with anguish to meet one erring in that homeless wild. They often murmur to themselves, they speak to one another seldom, for their woe broods maddeningly inward and scorns to wreak itself abroad. And if at wiles it grow to frenzy which must rave, none heeds the clamor, unless there waits some victim of light glamour to rave and turn who lends attentive show. The city is of night, but not of sleep. There sweet sleep is not for the weary brain, the pitiless hours like years and ages creep, a night seems termless hell. This dreadful strain of thought and consciousness which never ceases, or which some moment stupor but increases, this worse than woe makes wretches there insane. They leave all hope behind who enter there, one certitude while sane they cannot leave, one anodyne for torture and despair, the certitude of death, which no reprieve can put off long, and which, divinely tender, but waits the outstretched hand to promptly render that draught whose slumber nothing can bereave. 2. Because he seemed to walk with an intent, I followed him, who, shadow-like and frail, unswervingly though slowly onward went, regardless wrapped in thought as in a veil. Though step for step, with lonely sounding feet, we traveled many a long, dim, silent street. At length he paused, a black mass in the gloom, a tower that merged into the heavy sky. Around the huddled stones of grave and tomb, some old god's acre now corruption sty. He murmured to himself with dull despair, Pure faith died, poisoned by this charnel air. Then turning to the right, went on once more, and traveled weary roads without suspense and reached at last a low wall's open door, whose villa gleamed beyond the foliage dense. He gazed and muttered with a hard despair, Here love died, stabbed by its own worshipped pair. Then turning to the right resumed his march, and traveled street and lanes with wondrous strength, until on stooping through a narrow arch, we stood before a squalid house at length. He gazed and whispered with a cold despair, Here hope died, starved out in its utmost lair. When he had spoken thus, before he stirred, I spoke, perplexed by something in the signs of desolation I had seen and heard in this drear pilgrimage to ruined shrines, where faith and love and hope are dead indeed. Can life still live? By what doth it proceed? As whom his one intense thought overpowers, he answered coldly, Take a watch, erase the signs and figures of the circling hours, detach the hands, remove the dial face. The works proceed until run down, although bereft of purpose, void of use, still go. Then turning to the right paced on again, and traversed squares and travelled streets whose glooms seemed more and more familiar to my ken, and reached that sullen temple of the tombs, and paused to murmur with the old despair, Here faith died, poisoned by this charnel air. I ceased to follow, for the knot of doubt was severed sharply with a cruel knife. He circled thus forever, tracing out the series of the fraction left of life, Perpetual recurrence in the scope of but three terms, dead faith, dead love, dead hope. 3. Although lamps burn along the silent streets, even when moonlight silvers empty squares, the dark holds countless lanes and close retreats. But when the night its fearless mantle wears, the open spaces yawn with gloom abysmal, the somber mansions loom immense and dismal, the lanes are black as subterranean lairs. And soon the eye a strange new vision learns, the night remains for it is dark and dense, yet clearly in this darkness it discerns, as in the daylight with its natural sense, perceives a shade and shadow not obscurely, pursues a stir of black in blackness surely, sees spectres also in the gloom intense. The ear, too, with the silence vast and deep, becomes familiar though unreconciled, hears breathings as of hidden life asleep, and muffled throbs as of pet passions wild. Far murmurs, speech of pity or derision, but all more dubious than the things of vision, so that it knows not when it is beguiled. No time abates the first despair and awe, but wonder ceases soon. The weirdest thing is felt least strange beneath the lawless law, where death and life is the eternal king, crushed impotent beneath this reign of terror. Dazed with mysteries of woe and error, the soul is too outworn for wondering. 4. He stood alone within the spacious square, declaiming from the central grassy mound. With head uncovered and with streaming hair, as if large multitudes were gathered round, a stalwart shape, the gestures full of might, the glances burning with unnatural light. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, all was black. 
In heaven no single star, on earth no track. A brooding hush without a stir or note, The air so thick it clotted in my throat. And thus for hours, then some enormous things Swooped past with savage cries and clanking wings. But I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, eyes of fire glared at me throbbing with the starved desire. The hoarse and heavy and carnivorous breath was hot upon me from deep jaws of death. Sharp claws, swift talons, fleshless fingers cold, plucked at me from the bushes, tried to hold. But I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, lo you, there, that hillock burning with a brazen glare, those myriad dusky flames with points aglow, which writhed and hissed and darted to and fro, a sabbath of the serpents heard pell-mell, for devil's roll-call and some feet of hell. Yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, Meteors ran and crossed their javelins on the black sky span, the zenith opened to a gulf of flame, the dreadful thunderbolts jarred earth's fixed frame, the ground all heaved in waves of fire that surged, and weltered round me soul there unsubmerged. Yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, air once more, and I was close upon a wild seashore, Enormous cliffs arose on either hand, the deep tide thundered up a league-broad strand. White foam belts seethed there, wan spray swept and flew, the sky broke, moon and stars and clouds and blue. Yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, on the left the sun arose and crowned a broad crag cleft, and there stopped and burned out black, except a rim, a bleeding eyeless socket red and dim whereon the moon fell suddenly southwest, and stood above the right-hand cliffs at rest. Yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, from the right a shape came slowly with a ruddy light, a woman with a red lamp in her hand, bareheaded and barefooted on that strand. O oh, desolation moving with such grace, O oh, anguish with such beauty in thy face, I fell as on my bier, Hope travailed with such fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, I was twain, two selves distinct that cannot join again, one stood apart and knew but could not stir, and watched the other start in swoon and her, and she came on and never turned aside, between such moon and sun and roaring tide, and as she came more near, my soul grew mad with fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, hell is mild and piteous matched with that accursed wild. A large black sign was on her breast that bowed, a broad black band ran down her snow-white shroud. That lamp she held was her own burning heart, whose blood drops trickled step by step apart. The mystery was clear, mad rage had swallowed fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, by the sea she knelt and bent above that senseless me. Those lamp drops fell upon my white brow there. She tried to cleanse them with her tears and hair. She murmured words of pity, love, and woe. She heeded not the level rushing flow. And mad with rage and fear, I stood stone-bound so near. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert. When the tide swept up to her there kneeling by my side, she clasped that corpse like me, and they were borne away, and this vile me was left forlorn. I knew the whole sea cannot quench that heart or cleanse that brow, or wash those two apart. They love, their doom is drear, yet they not hope nor fear. But I, what do I hear? 5. How he arrives there none can clearly know, athwart the mountains and immense wild tracks, or flung a waif upon that vast sea flow, or down the river's boiling cataracts. To reach it is as dying fever stricken, to leave it slow faint birth intense pangs quicken, and memory swoons in both the tragic acts. But being there one feels a citizen, escape seems hopeless to the heart forlorn. Can death and life be brought to life again? And yet release does come, there comes a morn, when he awakes from slumbering so sweetly, that all the world is changed for him completely. And he is verily as if newborn. He scarcely can believe the blissful change, he weeps perchance who wept not while accursed. Never again will he approach the range infected by that evil spell now burst. 
Poor wretch, who once had placed that dolent city, shall pace it often, doomed beyond all pity, with horror ever deepening from the first. Though he possess sweet babes and loving wife, a home of peace by loyal friendships cheered, and love them more than death or happy life, they shall avail not, he must dree his weird, renounce all blessings for that imprecation, steal forth and haunt that builded desolation, of woe and terrors and thick darkness reared. 6. I sat forlornly by the river side, and watched the bridge lamps glow like golden stars, above the blackness of the swelling tide, down which they struck rough gold and ruddier bars, and heard the heave and plashing of the flow against the wall a dozen feet below. Large elm trees stood along that river walk, and under one, a few steps from my seat, I heard strange voices join in stranger talk. Although I had not heard approaching feet, these bodiless voices in my waking dream flow dark wards blending with somber stream. And you have after all come back, come back, I was about to follow on your track, and you have failed, our spark of hope is black. That I have failed is proved by my return, the spark is quenched, nor evermore will burn. But listen, and the story you shall learn. I reached the portal common spirits fear, and read the words above it, dark and clear. Leave hope behind, all ye who enter here. And would have passed in, gratified to gain that positive eternity of pain, instead of this insufferable inane. A demon warder clutched me, not so fast, first leave your hopes behind. But years have passed since I left all behind me to the last. You cannot count for hope with all your wit, this bleak despair that drives me to the pit. How could I seek to enter void of it? He snarled. What thing is this which apes a soul, and would find entrance to our gulf of dole without the payment of the settled toll? Outside the gate he showed an open chest. Here pay their entrance fees the souls unblessed. Cast in some hope, you enter with the rest. This is Pandora's box, whose lid shall shut, and Hellgate too, when hopes have filled it, but they are so thin that it will never glut. I took a few steps backwards, desolate, and watched the spirits pass me to their fate, and fling off hope, and enter at the gate. When one casts off a load, he springs upright, squares back his shoulders, breathes with all his might, and briskly paces to forward strong and light. But these, as if they took some burden bowed, the whole frame sank, however strong and proud, before they crept in quite infirm and cowed. And as they passed me, earnestly from each a morsel of his hope I did beseech, to pay my entrance, but all mocked my speech. No one would cede a little of his store, though knowing that in instance three or four he must resign the whole forevermore. So I return, our destiny is fell, for in this limbo we must ever dwell, shadowed alike from heaven and earth and hell. The other sighed back, Yea, but if we grope with care through all this limbo's dreary scope, we may yet pick up some minute lost hope, and sharing it between us, entrance win, in spite of fiends so jealous for gross sin. Let us without delay our search begin. 7. Some say that phantoms haunt those shadowy streets, and mingle freely there with sparse mankind, and tell of ancient woes and black defeats, and murmur mysteries in the grave enshrined. But others think them visions of illusion, or even men gone far in self-confusion, no man there being wholly sane in mind. And yet a man who raves, however mad, who bears his soul and tells of his own fall, reserves some inmost secret, good or bad. The phantoms have no reticence at all. The nudity of flesh will blush, though tameless. The extreme nudity of bone grins shameless. The unsexed skeleton mocks shroud and pall. I have seen phantoms there that were as men, and men that were as phantoms flit and roam, mark shapes that were not living to my ken, caught breathings acrid as with dead sea foam. The city rests for man so weird and awful, that his intrusion there might seem unlawful, and phantoms there may have their proper home. 8. While I still lingered on that river walk, and watched the tide as black as our black doom, I heard another couple join in talk, and saw them to the left hand in the gloom, seated against an elm bowl on the ground, their eyes intent upon the stream profound. I never knew another man on earth but had some joy and solace in his life, some chance of triumph in the dreadful strife. My doom has been unmitigated dearth. We gaze upon the river and we note the various vessels large and small that float, ignoring every wrecked and sunken boat. 
And yet I ask no splendid dower, no spoil of sway or fame or rank or even wealth, but homely love with common food and health, and nightly sleep to balance daily toil. This all too humble soul would arrogate into itself some signalizing hate from the supreme indifference of fate. Who is most wretched in this dolorous place? I think myself, yet I would rather be my miserable self than he, than he who formed such creatures to his own disgrace. The vilest thing must be less vile than thou, from whom it had its being, God and Lord, creator of all woe and sin, abhorred, malignant, and implacable. I vow that not for all thy power furled and unfurled, for all the temples to thy glory built, would I assume the ignominious guilt of having made such men in such a world. As if a being, god or fiend, could reign, at once so wicked, foolish, and insane, as to produce men whom he might refrain. The world rolls round forever like a mill, it grinds out death and life and good and ill, it has no purpose, heart, or mind, or will. While air of space and time's full river flow, the mill must blindly whirl unresting so. It may be wearing out, but who can know? Man might know one thing were his sight less dim, that it whirls not to suit his petty whim, that it is quite indifferent to him. Nay, does it treat him harshly as he saith? It grinds him some slow years of bitter breath, then grinds him back into eternal death. 9. It is full strange to him who hears and feels, when wandering there in some deserted street, the booming and the jar of ponderous wheels, the trampling clash of heavy iron-shod feet. Who is this Venice of the Black Sea rideth? Who in this city of the stars abideth to buy or sell as those in daylight sweet? The rolling thunder seems to fill the sky as it comes on, the horses snort and strain, the harness jingles as it passes by, the hugeness of an overburthened wain. A man sits nodding on the shaft or trudges, three parts asleep beside his fellow drudges, and so it rolls into the night again. What merchandise? Whence, whither, and for whom? Perchance it is a fate-appointed hearse, bearing away to some mysterious tomb or limbo of the scornful universe. The joy, the peace, the life, hope, the abortions of all things good which should have been our portioned, but have been strangled by that city's curse. 10. The mansion stood part in its own ground, in front thereof a fragrant garden lawn, high trees about it, and the whole walled round. The massy iron gates were both withdrawn, and every window of its front shed light, portentous in that city of the night. But though thus lighted it was deadly still, as all the countless bulks of solid gloom, perchance a congregation to fulfill solemnities of silence in this doom, mysterious rites of dolor and despair, permitting not a breath or chant of prayer. Broad steps ascended to a terrace broad, whereon lay still light from the open door. The hall was noble, and its aspect odd, hung round with heavy black from dome to floor, and ample stairways rose to left and right, whose balustrades were also draped with night. I paced from room to room, from hall to hall, nor any life throughout the maze discerned, but each was hung with its funereal pall, and held a shrine around which tapers burned, with picture or with statue or with bust, all copied from the same fair form of dust. A woman very young and very fair, beloved by bounteous life and joy and youth, and loving these sweet lovers so that care and age and death seem not for her in sooth, alike as stars, all beautiful and bright, these shapes lit up that mausoleum night. At length I heard a murmur as of lips, and reached an open oratory hung with heaviest blackness of the holy clips. Beneath the dome a fuming censer swung, and one lay there upon a low white bed, with tapers burning at the foot and head. The lady of the images supine, death still, life sweet, with folded palms she lay, and kneeling there is at a sacred shrine, a young man wan and worn who seemed to pray, a crucifix of dim and ghostly white surmounted the large altar left at night. The chambers of the mansion of my heart, and every one whereof thine image dwells, are black with grief eternal for thy sake. The inmost oratory of my soul, wherein thou ever dwellest quick or dead, is black with the grief eternal for thy sake. I kneel beside thee, and I clasp the cross, with eyes forever fixed upon that face, so beautiful and dreadful in its calm. I kneel here patient as thou liest there, as patient as a statue carved in stone, of adoration and eternal grief. While thou dost not awake, I cannot move, and something tells me thou will never wake, and I alive feel turning into stone. Most beautiful were death to end my grief, 
most hateful to destroy the sight of thee, dear vision better than all death or life. But I renounce all choice of life or death, for either shall be ever at thy side, and thus in bliss or woe be ever well. He murmured thus and thus in monotone, intent upon that uncorrupted face, entranced except his moving lips alone, I glided with hushed footsteps from the place. This was the festival that filled with light, that palace in the city of the night. 11. What men are they who haunt these fatal glooms, and fill their living mouths with dust of death, and make their habitations in the tombs, and breathe eternal sighs with mortal breath, and pierce life's pleasant veil of various error, to reach that void of darkness and old terror, wherein expire the lamps of hope and faith? They have much wisdom, yet they are not wise. They have much goodness, yet they do not well. The fools we know have their own paradise, the wicked also have their proper hell. They have much strength, but still their doom is stronger, much patience, but their time endureth longer, much valor, but life mocks it with some spell. They are most rational, and yet insane, and outward madness not to be controlled, a perfect reason in the central brain, which has no power, but sitteth wan and cold, and sees the madness, and foresees as plainly, the ruin in its path, and trieth vainly, to cheat itself refusing to behold. And some are great in rank and wealth and power, and some are known for genius and for worth, and some are poor and mean, who brood and cower and shrink from notice, and accept all dearth of body, heart and soul, and leave to others all boons of life. Yet these and those are brothers, the saddest and the weariest men on earth. 12. Our isolated units could be brought to act together for some common end? For one by one, each silent with his thought, I marked a long loose line approach and wend, athwart the great cathedral's cloistered square, and slowly vanished from the moonlit air. Then I would follow in among the last, and in the porch a shrouded figure stood, who challenged each one pausing ere he passed, with deep eyes burning through a blank white hood. Whence come you in the world of life and light, to this our city of tremendous night? From pleading in a senate of rich lords for some scant justice to our countless hordes, who toil half-starved with scarce a human right, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From wandering through many a solemn scene of opium visions, with a heart serene, an intellect miraculously bright, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From making hundreds laugh and roar with glee by my transcendent feats of mimicry, and humor wanton as an elvish sprite, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From prayer and fasting in a lonely cell, which brought an ecstasy ineffable of love and adoration and delight, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From ruling on a splendid kingly throne, a nation which beneath my rule has grown year after year in wealth and arts and might, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From preaching to an audience fired with faith, the Lamb who died to save our souls from death, whose blood hath washed our scarlet sins wool white, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From drinking fiery poison in a den crowded with tawdry girls and squalid men, who hoarsely laugh and curse and brawl and fight, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From picturing with all beauty and all grace, first Eden and the parents of our race, a luminous rapture unto all men's sight, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From writing a great work with patient plan to justify the ways of God to man, and show how ill must fade and perish quite, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From desperate fighting with a little band against the powerful tyrants of our land, to free our brethren in their own despite, I wake from daydreams to this real night. Thus, challenged by that warder, sad and stern, each one responded with his countersign, then entered the cathedral, and in turn, I entered also, having given mine, but lingered near until I heard no more, and marked the closing of that massive door. 13. Of all things human which are strange and wild, this is perchance the wildest and most strange, and showeth man most utterly beguiled, to those who haunt that sunless city's range. That he bemoans himself for I, repeating how time is deadly swift, how life is fleeting, how naught is constant on the earth but change. The hours are heavy on him in the days, the burden of the months he scarce can bear, and often in his secret soul he prays to sleep through barren periods unaware, arousing at some longed-for date of pleasure, which having passed and yielded him small treasure, he would outsleep another term of care. Yet in his marvelous fancy he must make quick wings for time, and see it fly from us, this time which crawleth like a monstrous snake, wounded and slow and very venomous, 
which creeps blindworm-like round the earth and ocean, distilling poison at each painful motion, and seems condemned to circle ever thus. And since he cannot spend and use aright the little time here given him in trust, but wasteth it in weary undelight, of foolish toil and treble, strife and lust, he naturally claimeth to inherit the everlasting future, that his merit may have full scope, as surely is most just. O length of the intolerable hours! O nights that are as eons of slow pain! O time too ample for our vital powers! O life whose woeful vanities remain immutable for all of all our legions, through all the centuries and in all the regions! Not of your speed and variance we complain! We do not ask a longer term of strife, weakness and weariness and nameless woes! We do not claim renewed and endless life when this which is our torment here shall close, an everlasting conscious in a nation! We yearn for speedy death and full fruition, dateless oblivion and divine repose. 14. Large glooms were gathered in the mighty fane, with tinted moon gleams slanting here and there, and all was hush, no swelling organ strain, no chant, no voice or murmuring of prayer, no priests came forth, no tinkling censers fumed, and the high altar space was unillumed. Around the pillars and against the walls leaned men in shadows, others seemed to brood, bent a recumbent in secluded stalls. Perchance they were not a great multitude, save in that city of so lonely streets, where one may count up every face he meets. All patiently awaited the event, without a stir or sound, as if no less self-occupied, doom-stricken while attent. And then we heard a voice of solemn stress from the dark pulpit, and our gaze there met, two eyes which burned as never eyes burned yet. Two steadfast and intolerable eyes, burning beneath a broad and rugged brow, the head behind it of enormous size, and as black fir groves in a large wind bow, a rooted congregation, gloom arrayed, by that great sad voice deep and full were swayed. O melancholy brothers, dark, 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 O battling in black floods without an ark, O spectral wanderers of unholy night, my soul hath bled for you these sunless years, with bitter blood drops running down like tears, O dark, 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 withdrawn from joy and light. My heart is sick with anguish for your bale, your woe hath been my anguish, yea, I quail, and perish in your perishing unblessed. And I have searched the heights and depths, the scope of all our universe, with desperate hope, to find some solace for your wild unrest. And now at last authentic word I bring, witnessed by every dead and living thing, good tidings of great joy for you, for all. There is no God, no fiend with names divine, made us and tortures us, if we must pine, it is to satiate no being's gall. It was the dark delusion of a dream, that living person conscious and supreme, whom we must curse for cursing us with life, whom we must curse because the life he gave could not be buried in the quiet grave, could not be killed by poison or the knife. This little life is all we must endure, the grave's most holy peace is ever sure, we fall asleep and never wake again. Nothing is of us but the moldering flesh, whose elements dissolve and merge afresh, in earth, air, water, plants, and other men. We finish thus, and all our wretched race shall finish with its cycle, and give place to other beings with their own time doom. Infinite eons ere our kind began, infinite eons after the last man has joined the mammoth in earth's tomb and womb. We bow down to the eternal laws, which never had for man a special clause of cruelty or kindness, love or hate. If toads and vultures are obscene to sight, if tigers burn with beauty and with might, is it by favor or by wrath of fate? All substance lives and struggles evermore, through countless shapes continually at war, by countless interactions interknit. If one is born a certain day on earth, all times and forces tended to that birth, not all the world could change or hinder it. I find no hint throughout the universe of good or ill, of blessing or of curse. I find alone necessity supreme, with infinite mystery, abysmal, dark, unlighted ever by the faintest spark, for us the flitting shadows of a dream. O oh, brothers of sad lives, they are so brief. A few short years must bring us all relief. Can we not bear these years of laboring breath? But if you would not this poor life fulfill, lo, you are free to end it when you will, without the fear of waking after death. The organ-like vibrations of his voice thrilled to the vaulted aisles and died away. The yearning of the tones which bade rejoice was sad and tender as a requiem lay. Our shadowy congregation rested still, as brooding on that. End it when you will. 15. Wherever men are gathered, all the air is charged with human feeling, human thought. 
Each shout and cry and laugh, each curse and prayer, are into its vibration surely wrought. Unspoken passion, wordless meditation, are breathed into it with our respiration. It is with our life fraught and overfraught. So that no man there breathes earth's simple breath, as if alone on mountains or wide seas, but nourishes warm life or hastens death, with joys and sorrows, health and foul disease, wisdom and folly, good and evil labors. Incessant of his multitudinous neighbors, he is in turn affecting all of these. That city's atmosphere is dark and dense, although not many exiles wander there, with many a potent evil influence, each adding poison to the poisoned air. Infections of unutterable sadness, infections of incalculable madness, infections of incurable despair. 16. Our shadowy congregation rested still, as musing on that message we had heard, and brooding on that, end it when you will. Perchance awaiting yet some other word, when keen as lightning through a muffled sky sprang forth a shrill and lamentable cry. The man speaks soothe, alas, the man speaks soothe, we have no personal life beyond the grave. There is no God, fate knows nor wrath nor roof, can I find here the comfort which I crave? In all eternity I had one chance, one few years' term of gracious human life. The splendors of the intellect's advance, the sweetness of the home with babes and wife, the social pleasures with their genial wit, the fascination of the worlds of art, the glories of the worlds of nature, lit by large imagination's glowing heart, the rapture of mere being full of health, the careless childhood and the ardent youth, the strenuous manhood winning various wealth, the reverend age serene with life's long truth. All the sublime prerogatives of man, the storied memories of the times of old, the patient tracking of the world's great plan through sequences and changes myriadfold. This chance was never offered me before. For me, this infinite past is blank and dumb. This chance recurreth never, never more. Blank, blank for me the infinite to come. And this sole chance was frustrate from my birth, a mockery, a delusion, and my breath of noble human life upon this earth so racks me that I sigh for senseless death. My wine of life is poison mixed with gall. My noonday passes in a nightmare dream. I worse than lose the years which are my all. What can console me for the loss supreme? Speak not of comfort where no comfort is. Speak not at all. Can words make foul things fair? Are life's a cheat, or death a black abyss? Hush and be mute, envisioning despair. The vehement voice came from the northern isle, rapid and shrill to its abrupt harsh close, and none gave answer for a certain while, for words must shrink from these most wordless woes. At last the pulpit speaker simply said, with humid eyes and thoughtful drooping head, My brother, my poor brothers, it is thus. This life whole itself holds nothing good for us, but ends soon and never more can be. And we knew nothing of it ere our birth, and shall know nothing when consigned to earth. I ponder these thoughts, and they comfort me. 17. How the moon triumphs through the endless nights! How the stars throb and glitter as they wheel their thick processions of supernal lights around the blue vault obdurate as steel! And men regard with passionate awe and yearning the mighty marching and the golden burning, and think the heavens respond to what they feel. Boats gliding like dark shadows of a dream are glorified from vision as they pass, the quivering moon bridge on the deep black stream Cold windows kindle their dead glooms of glass to restless crystals. Cornice dome and column emerge from chaos in the splendor solemn. Like fairy lakes gleam lawns of dewy grass. With such a living light these dead eyes shine, these eyes of sightless heaven, that as we gaze, we read a pity, tremulous, divine, or cold, majestic scorn in their pure rays. Fond man, they are not hearty, are not tender. There is no heart or mind in all their splendor. They thread mere puppets all their marvelous maze. If we could near them with the flight unflown, we should but find them worlds as sad as this, or suns all self-consuming like our own, and bringed by planet worlds as much amiss. They wax and wane through fusion and confusion, the spheres eternal are a grand illusion, the Empyrean is a void abyss. 18. I wandered in a suburb of the north, and reached a spot whence three closed lanes led down. Beneath thick trees and hedgerows winding forth, Like deep brook channels, deep and dark and lown, The air above was wan with misty light, The dull gray south showed one vague blur of white. 
I took the left-hand path and slowly trod its earthen footpath, brushing as I went the humid leafage. And my feet were shod with heavy languor, and my frame downbent, with infinite sleepless wearings outworn. So many nights I thus had paced forlorn. After a hundred steps I grew aware of something crawling in the lane below. It seemed a wounded creature prostrate there, that sobbed with pangs in making progress slow. The hind limbs stretched to push, the forelimbs then to drag, for it would die in its own den. But coming level with it, I discerned that it had been a man, for at my tread it stopped in its sore travail and half turned, leaning upon its right and raised its head, and with the left hand twitched back as an ire, long gray unreverend locks befalled with mire. A haggard, filthy face with bloodshot eyes, an infamy for manhood to behold. He gasped all trembling, What? You want my prize? You leave to rob me wine and lust and gold, and all that men go mad upon, since you have traced my secret scent of the clue? You think that I am weak and must submit, yet I but scratch you with this poisoned blade, and you are as dead as if I clove with it that false, fierce, greedy heart. Betrayed! Betrayed! I fling this file if you seek to pass, and you are forthwith shriveled up like grass. And then with sudden change, take thought, take thought, have pity on me, it is mine alone. If you could find it, it would avail you not. Seek elsewhere on the pathway of your own, for who of mortal or mortal race the life track of another can retrace? Did you but know my agony and toil? Two lanes diverge up yonder from this lane. My thin blood marks the long length of their soil. Such clue I left who sought my clue in vain. My hands and knees are worn both flesh and bone. I cannot move but with continuous moan. But I am in the very way at last to find the long-lost broken golden thread which unites my present with my past, if you but go your own way. And I said, I will retire as soon as you have told whereunto leadeth this lost thread of gold. And so you know it not, he hissed with scorn. I feared you, imbecile. It leads me back from this accursed night without a morn, and through the desert which have else no track, and through vast wastes of horror-haunted time, to Eden innocent in Eden's clime. And I become a nursling, soft and pure, an infant cradled on its mother's knee, without a past, love cherished and secure, which if I saw this loathsome present me, would plunge its face into the pillowing breast, and scream abhorrence hard to lull to rest. He turned to grope, and I, retiring, brushed thin shreds of gossamer from off my face, and mused. His life would grow, the germ uncrushed. He should to antenatal night retrace, and hide his elements in that large womb, beyond the reach of man-evolving doom. And even thus, what weary way were planned, to seek oblivion through the far-off gate of birth, when that of death is close at hand. For this is the law, if law there be in fate. What never has been, yet may have its when. The thing which has been never is again. 19. The mighty river flowing dark and deep, with ebb and flood from the remote sea tides, vague sounding th through the city's sleepless sleep, is named the river of the suicides. For night by night some lord wretch overweary, and shuddering from the future yet more dreary, within its cold secure oblivion hides. One plunges from a bridge's parapet, as if by some blind and sudden frenzy hurled. Another wades in slow, with purpose set, until the waters are above him furled. Another in a boat with dreamlike motion glides drifting down into the desert ocean to starve or sink from out the desert world. They perish from their suffering surely thus, for none beholding them attempts to save, the while thinks how soon solicitous he may seek refuge in the self-same wave. Some hour when tired of ever vain endurance, impatience will forerun the sweet assurance of perfect peace eventual in the grave. When this poor tragic farce has palled us long, why actors and spectators do we stay? To fill our so short roles out right or wrong, to see what shifts are yet in the dull play for our illusion, to refrain from grieving dear foolish friends by our untimely leaving. But those asleep at home, how blessed they are. Yet it is but for one night after all. What matters one brief night of dreary pain? When after it the weary eyelids fall upon the weary eyes and wasted brain, and all sad scenes and thoughts and feelings vanish, in that sweet sleep no power can ever banish, the one best sleep which never wakes again. 20. I sat me weary on a pillar's base, and leaned against the shaft, for broad moonlight o'erflowed the peacefulness of cloistered space, a shore of shadow slanting from the right, the great cathedral's western front stood there, a wave-worn rock in that calm sea of air. Before it, opposite my place of rest, 
Two figures faced each other, large, austere, a couchant sphinx in shadow to the breast, an angel standing in the moonlight clear. So mighty by magnificence of form, they were not dwarfed beneath that mass enorm. Upon the cross-hilt of the naked sword, the angel's hands, as prompt to smite, were held. His vigilant, intense regard was poured upon the creature placidly unquelled, whose front was set at level gaze which took, no heed of aught, a solemn trance-like look. And as I pondered these opposed shapes, my eyelids sank in stupor, that dull swoon which drugs and with a leaden mantle drapes the outworn to worse weariness. But soon a sharp and clashing noise the stillness broke, and from the evil lethargy I woke. The angel's wings had fallen stone on stone, and lay there shattered, hence the sudden sound. A warrior leaning on his sword alone now watched the sphinx with that regard profound. The sphinx unchained looked forthright as aware of nothing in the vast abyss of air. Again I sank in that repose unsweet, again a clashing noise my slumber rent. The warrior's sword lay broken at his feet, an unarmed man with raised hands impotent now stood before the sphinx, which ever kept such mien as if open eyes it slept. My eyelids sank in spite of wonder groan, a larder crash upstartled me in dread. The man had fallen forward stone on stone, and lay there shattered, with his trunkless head between the monster's large quiescent paws, beneath its grand front changeless as life's laws. The moon has circled westward full and bright, and made the temple front a mystic dream, and bathed the whole enclosure with its light, the sordid angel's wrecks, the sphinx supreme. I pondered long that cold majestic face, whose vision seemed of infinite void space. 21. A near the center of that northern crest stands out a level upland bleak and bare, from which the city east and south and west sinks gently in long waves, and throned there an image sits, stupendous, superhuman, the bronze colossus of a winged woman, upon a graded granite base four square. Low seated she leans forward massively, with cheek unclenched left hand, the forearms might erect, its elbow on a rounded knee. Across a clasped book in her lap, the right upholds a pair of compasses. She gazes with full-set eyes, but wandering in thick mazes, of somber thought beholds no outward sight. Words cannot picture her, but all men know that solemn sketch the pure sad artist wrought three centuries and threescore years ago, with fantasies of his peculiar thought, the instruments of carpentry and science scattered about her feet, in strange alliance with the keen wolfhound sleeping undistraught. Scales, hourglass, bell, and magic square above, the grave and solid infant perched beside, with open winglets that might bear a dove, intent upon its tablets, heavy-eyed, her folded wings as of a mighty eagle, but all too impotent to lift the regal robustness of her earthborn strength and pride. And with those wings, and that light wreath which seems to mock her grand head and the knotted frown of forehead charged with baleful thoughts and dreams, the household bunch of keys, the housewife's gown voluminous, indented and yet rigid, as if a shell of burnished metal frigid, the feet thick shod to tread all weakness down. The comet hanging o'er the waste dark seas, the massy rainbow curved in front of it, beyond the village with the masts and trees, the snaky imp dog-headed from the pit, bearing upon its bat-like leathern pinions, her name unfolded in the sun's dominions, the melancholia that transcends all wit. Thus has the artist copied her, and thus surrounded to expound her form sublime, her fate heroic and calamitous, fronting the dreadful mysteries of time. Unvanquished in defeat and desolation, undaunted in the hopeless conflagration of the day setting on her baffled prime. Baffled and beaten back, she works on still. Weary and sick of soul, she works the more, sustained by her indomitable will. The hand shall fashion, and the brain shall pour, and all her sorrow shall be turned to labor, till death the friend-foe piercing with his saber, that mighty heart of hearts ends bitter war. But as if blacker night could dawn on night, with tenfold gloom on moonless night unstarred, a sense more tragic than defeat and blight, more desperate than strife with hope debarred, more fatal than the adamantine never, encompassing her passionate endeavor, dawns glooming in her tenebrous regard. To sense that every struggle brings defeat, because fate holds no prize to crown success, that all the oracles are dumb or cheat because they have no secrets to express, that none can pierce the vast black veil uncertain, because there is no light beyond the curtain, that all is vanity and nothingness. Titanic from her high throne in the north, 
that city's somber patroness and queen, in bronze sublimity she gazes forth, over her capital of Teen and Threen, over the river with its isles and bridges, the marsh and moorland to the stern rock bridges, confronting them with a coeval mien. The moving moon and stars from east to west circle before her in the sea of air. Shadows and gleams glide round her solemn rest. Her subjects often gaze up to her there. The strength to drink new strength of iron endurance, the weak new terrors, all renewed assurance, and confirmation of the old despair. End of The City of Dreadful Night by James Thompson Read by Karen Joan Kahodik. Octoberzine.blogspot.com